And I have been affected by it. And that's one of the reasons why this project is very close to me. And certainly my experience is a lot more private than sometimes, you know, you know, the science behind it drives it. Yeah. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Robert Schmidt. I am Deloitte's Chief IoT Technologist, also known as Mr. IoT, and this is my weekly show, Coffee with Mr. IoT. Today, my guest is Manisha Mohan, uh, a MIT grad, and you are working on some very, very interesting things. Uh, I, I just learned you call them techno-social. Um, I have a little thing I talk about uh, the human impact of IoT, and I think you are a living example of this. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. What what are you working on, or what did you work on at MIT? And um, you know, I was fascinated by it, and I, I wanted to hear more about that. Sure. Thank you so much first uh, for inviting me on the show. Um, I'm a recent graduate from MIT Media Lab, and I worked uh, a lot around how we can embed technology. Uh, to address social issues. And uh, one of my important projects from my thesis is Intrepid. It's a wearable sensor which goes on top of any kind of fabric. It's like a sticker, so you can stick it anywhere. And uh, the technology behind it is that it detects, uh, communicates, and most importantly, documents sexual abuse and tries to prevent it in real time. Uh, the device tries to understand how you remove your clothing versus when somebody else is trying to remove it off your body even when you are unconscious. So it tries to record that particular incident if it's flagged as an act of sexual assault and uh, sends your information uh, to five people who are predefined in as your safety circle. So they get the information about where you are and when the incident took place. And uh, one person also receives a phone call, which helps us to create legal evidences as we are proceeding towards it. and. Uh, uh, it records all the audio in the background to ensure that if the victim really feels like filing a complaint later on in the future, they can, uh, you know, call out for help or, you know, showcase this audio and be like, yes, there was something which was wrong. So, yeah, that's a little bit about Intrepid. Yeah. So there is Intrepid. There's a sticker. How big yeah. is the sticker? It's like a five cross one centimeter. Uh, it's just and a small sticker. It's a patch and it goes on clothing and it knows how I take my clothing off versus if someone else would take it off. And then yes. it alerts people, uh, creates evidence and records what goes on. Did I get that right? Yes. Sounds amazing to me. It sounds something that's really um, unfortunately needed. Um, and um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, how far did you take this? So I heard a lot about what it does. Uh, did you test this? Have you just tell me a little bit about how how far you've taken this? Yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, testing the technology uh, at MIT, we are supposed to test all what we make. So it's all about human computer interaction. So we definitely had to do uh, laboratory trials, and then we had to go a step further and ask people to wear it as a part of you know, uh, testing different features of it. So we made people do exercises with it, uh, wear it on their body and like walk around and um, do, do their basic stuff, uh, try to wash it in their normal washing cycle. And uh, we also had to organize um, exhibits where people could come and give us feedback. So it's a long process from like design thinking stage where people come and tell you what the issue is at a later stage when you just show the prototype to people and they give you feedback about how to iterate it. And the later stage is just testing the technology with people and making them wear it. So we tested around uh, 64 plus people at the intermediate stage. And then we went on and did like trials for different features of the device with like a but set of 10. Yeah. Do you have instances where it prevented sexual assault? So we didn't come across an act of assault so far. Uh, you, did, you did not. We did not. We did not. Yeah. So this was all being done in like controlled environment, laboratory settings, uh, when we did the actual setup. 
uh, it's very difficult to stimulate an act of sexual assault and it's kind of not a part of IRB. So we don't want to walk in that space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to say, unfortunately, um, and I mean, really, fortunately, you didn't run into it. But at the same token, it'd be really mm -hmm. curious to see how it does help with preventing. Yeah. Is there, <clears throat> I'm kind of curious, many, when I think of alarm systems at houses, right? A lot yeah. about is that sign that sits in front of the house to tell people that house is protected. How mm -hmm. much of what you talked about was about that too? There's sort of like a, hey. Yeah, so uh, my thesis advisor, the committee itself, uh, did propose that you know we could also do something like this, that when it says that you are safe or you're protected, people might not come and do something uh, to you. Uh, but when you look from the, uh, you know, the user perspective, uh, since a large group of this is women, they, they have a particular way of dressing up. And it's a very personal, it's related to their identity, it's related to who they are and uh, what they want to project or what their mood is all about. And fixing that particular label that, you know, I'm protected or a gadget which says that, you know, lights up or we did discuss about if we had an alarm or if we had like a light which glows up. Uh, we felt that that would be too intrusive and people might not like it. And when we went with these ideas to the general public, obviously they did not want them to be dressed like that. So it was actually a design design decision which was taken with the audience together to make it something which is like a sticker, which goes on any kind of fabric, gives them flexibility to wear whatever they want. Yeah. Do you have one of those stickers to show us how it looks like? Unfortunately, I didn't have it one uh, right now. But then, yeah, if I, you would have told me, I would have got one today. Yeah. You know, I have to say the Me Too movement for me, what was the most, what impacted me probably the most was to see how many people were impacted by it and how many women in my life that um, I didn't even know how they were impacted by that. So it brought up the conversation, which I was really... Um, impacted by, touched by, and also made me realize um, how I can make an impact around this. I'm curious for you, why this? Do you have a personal um, connection to this topic? Or and I just want to say we talked about this before, so you said it was okay to ask you this because you've talked about yeah, this. Yeah, sure. Tell us about um, that. Yeah. Uh, so I come from India, and sexual abuse in India is very common um, and it, this happens both in public and academic spaces and I personally have been affected by it in both public and academic spaces and um, definitely uh, as you've seen in the Me Too movement as well uh, you know victims generally don't have a, a lot of power at that particular moment to speak up or speak against the uh, assaulter and uh, the three important reasons why they aren't able to do it because of the emotional, physical, or the hierarchical domination. And I have been affected by it. And that's one of the reasons why this project is very close to me. And certainly my experience is a lot more drive it than sometimes, you know, you know, the science behind it drives it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I also heard that you worked on another project at MIT, which is similarly interesting uh, from a techno-social point of view. You mm -hmm. are a fountain of, uh, let me take difficult social issues and give it a technology spin. Can you tell <laughs> us a little bit about your gender bias uh, project? Sure. It's called as the Cultural Lens. Uh, it was a design, speculative design project. Uh, and we were just trying to understand uh, issues of gender biases. And a lot of countries have uh, uh, laws for women to dress up in a particular way or custom traditions force women to dress up in a particular way or like using the veil in, in countries like India. Uh, women are expected to cover up their body while they're going to a particular place or in general, you know, uh, dressing provocatively, which is a very, very uh, regional definition for them. So we really wanted to understand how men would feel if they are forced to dress up in a particular way. So we made this we are um, um, application, which would ask men to 
put this on or force them to put it on if they are decent and innocent kind of men and they feel that uh, they don't want to look at uh, provocatively dressed women but instead women don't have to change their style of dressing and uh, the device actually where it does is the moment it sees a, a provocatively dressed woman which is according to the guy it just puts a veil on top of the woman's uh, body and so the guy only gets to see the eyes and rest all is covered in black and uh, the idea behind this project was just to uh, make people realize that you know when you force somebody to dress up in a particular way it takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot of effort uh, from their side and you should experience the same pain as well and just try and understand how it feels like. And we were hoping that this would change a lot of uh, people's mindset. And uh, while we talk about this technology, it certainly, you know, triggers an alarm to a lot of women who have young boys. And they're like, no, my child should not wear it because he's very decent. And the next question we ask is, if he is, then he should definitely wear this because he's not going to go and do anything to these women, right? So, yeah. That's something which we did. So what, I understand what you did. I understand the lens. What did you do after? Did you have surveys after that or how did that go? So we generally start triggering conversations around it and we start talking to people. Uh, last June, uh, when I was in India, we did it as a part of MIT India project, just talking about this project, showing them the project and making the experience. And it definitely creates like, two-way conversation sometimes it's very heated up because these all things are very culturally embedded in the Indian soil so when you talk to very uh, conservative people uh, who are driven by culture and society it always makes it very difficult to like even have a conversation like this because they're like whoa where, where is this coming from why is it even coming to us you know uh, why do I have to prove that I am not looking at women this way or why does my son have to do this so it just depends you whom you're talking to. But if you look at people who are in the urban settings who have a, a very different outlook towards society, uh, it's very easy to draw them into this. And they're like, yeah, why not? Sure. You know, first of all, nobody should be doing this. Secondly, we don't have issues with women wearing whatever they feel comfortable with. So, yeah. I'm fascinated by what you do. I find what you do amazing. And thank you for sharing this with us on the show. Um, I have to, so I, I just want to switch topics for a second. Um, so I look at what you, what you have behind you. Is that behind you on your right? Is that a 3D printer? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Are you printing patches back there now? <laughs> no, we printed a batch this morning, so we don't have anything up running right now. <laughs> okay. So you graduated from MIT. Um, are you still working in this techno-social field or wh where does someone graduating with all this really, um, I'm going to have to say what fascinates me the most about you is how you talk about these difficult topics in a factual yet kind of very open way. Uh, how do you take this and bring this into the work environment? Um, you worked in a lab in research now. What do you do today and, and how did that transition go? So I think it's uh, more about how you use the technology after you graduate, because your mindset is uh, focused on addressing issues which are more social, but you're using technology as a tool to address them. Uh, now, after graduation, I'm uh, actually working with uh, flavors and fragrances company, IFF, and um, we look at uh, social issues very differently and through a different lens altogether. Uh, my work revolves a lot around how we can enable the way things are being communicated via technology. So that's another very different feel. But yes, what brought me here was another project which I did at MIT related to flavors and fragrances. We were trying to understand how sexual arousal could be, uh, you know, reduced using odor. So that's how I started getting involved into olfaction and uh, odors and molecules, and that's the bridge. And we're just trying to work towards it in a different way, yeah. If you're just joining the show, you're watching Coffee with Mr. IoT. Today, my guest is Manisha Mohan, uh, a graduate from MIT and now a technologist at IFF. Um, 
Did I hear you right? You said you're looking at fragrances that decrease arousal. I always yes. thought of fragrances the other way around. Yes. So uh, there, uh, there are a lot of odors which, uh, which can reduce uh, sexual arousal. And we got inspiration from the wild, uh, a skunk. And, you know, we just started thinking about it, how this could actually work in the real world. And so we got people in our lab uh, at MIT and made them experience different palettes. Uh, and we had a stimulant running at the same side. We had them watch a pornographic uh, video and images and GIFs. And while they were sexually stimulated, we were making them experience these odors and we were asking them uh, to rate that experience. And we found a palette of 13 odors which can actually do it in real time. And uh, if you look into more of literature, there's a lot of study around that as well. There's a nature publication about how the odor of the teardrop can drop sexual uh, arousal drastically. Yeah. Okay. So I have to say this might be the um, most controversial show I've ever done in terms of topics. And yet it's done in such a um, uh, caring way. I appreciate that. I'm laughing myself here. So that was at MIT. I thought maybe I misunderstood. So at IFF now, it ain't about uh, the arousal part. You're doing something different. Or did yeah, I I'm, I'm something right of doing something completely different. So that was the bridge. You did that for MIT yeah. and then, okay, I got it, I got yeah. it. So how much can you tell us what you're doing today? And if, you, if the answer is nothing, that's okay too. I'm just curious. Because I I mean, you're not going to get out of the world of Internet of Things, are you? No, I'm definitely not going to get out of the world of Internet of Things. It's certainly uh, uh, my backbone. It shapes me and my world. And um, uh, I, I can't think of getting out of it because that's my future. <laughs> are you wearing a Fitbit? No, I don't wear Fitbit. What do you wear? I don't wear it because right now I'm not sharing data. <laughs> <laughs> So what about IFF? Can you tell us what you do there? So uh, a little bit which I can share with you is we're working in technologies which can create a, a bridge between how we communicate and to make it more um, wholesome because at this point we are certainly sharing videos and audios um, and one sense which is really missing is odor and we're looking forward to see how we can integrate odor in digital communication or in applications, yeah. So we can do visual, we can do audio. Now you're working on the sense, the last yes. one then will be touch, right? Yes. Got it, well, very fascinating, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you something different. I wanna come back a little bit to techno social and just take this down one mm -hmm. step for you and me. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't know if you know, but I'm originally Austrian. I came to this country 22 years ago, and mm -hmm. um, I consider this my home now. In German, actually, there is two words. There's a word for a home and a country you come from. Uh, oh. I always say home, home, uh, okay. because Heimat, what, which is the German word, doesn't exist in, um, in English. So my home, home is Austria, but my home is here now. And mm -hmm. I have always loved being, um, uh, being here. There was something I felt very welcome. I'm kind of curious how you feel. I, I don't know. How long have you been here, number one? Number two, um, how was it for you as a, an Indian woman to come to the United States? Contrasts, comparisons, you know, we go deep into techno, uh, social. Now let's go into social. I'm just curious about you and your experience. Yeah, so I came to the country uh, three years ago uh, for my master's. Uh, but my transition from India was indirect to United States. I had... I uh, worked for a couple of months in Sweden as uh, as an intern. So that really helped me to see the Western side of the world. Uh, it was a great opening. And um, when I came to United States right after Sweden, I think I was a little disappointed because Sweden had set my levels really high. And uh, <laughs> Your levels of what? I'm curious now. Um, so you went from you know, India just... to Sweden to US. There's another point. This is even more interesting now. Go for it. Oh yeah, so Sweden had um, Sweden is definitely more developed, and when you talk about you know housing, infrastructure, uh, organizations, and everything. So when I came to United States, uh, I remember I had landed from the airport, and it was eight p.m. 
I went to my dorm and I was like, wow, they don't have windows like Sweden. They're not insulated that well. <laughs> uh, but that's just something, you know. Uh, uh, I felt Sweden was way more organized and uh, the, the pace at which they live their life is uh, easier and comfortable and um, more welcoming. Uh, since I landed in Cambridge, yes, you could see all those, you know, uh, geeky, nerdy faces, but then the smile was missing. Uh, whereas in Sweden, the smile was always there and uh, very welcoming. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, interesting. And how do you feel about the how, how do you feel about gender? How do you feel about acceptance of gender differences, gender fluidity, and how do you feel about um, uh, racial differences between India, Sweden, and the U.S.? I think more than gender, I feel that uh, racial differences here are. Uh, subtle but loud in their own way it's passive aggressive uh, whereas if you talk about gender I really like something I was there at a conference uh, NC wit uh, last year and it was a women uh, women in IT conference but the way it, everybody was talking about women issues was very amazing because in India I know that everybody recognizes there's a lot of problem, but less number of people talk about it, or it's pseudo feminism there. Uh, people want to be feminist, uh, but then at the back of their mind there, or the things they practice, they are still very chauvinist. Uh, whereas in the United States, I see that a lot of people in both sex, uh, not just men, women, and other groups, everybody talks about it. And they're pretty clear. They know that this is right. And this is wrong. But in India still, there's a confusion uh, around what is right and what is wrong and how to give people their space, their choices. And that's where I feel that there's a struggle there. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. So let me take this back. We're going to, we have about another two or three minutes to go and I just want to go and look forward a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. If you could take your technology anywhere into social, where would you take it? And what, uh, where do you see internet of things go uh, in our society in general. Just look at the future a little bit and give me your thoughts on that. So I'll answer your second question first. I do see that Internet of Things is amazing. And I know that tomorrow my clothes are going to be talking more than what I know about my body or about, you know, how I express or uh, what I feel. And that's what uh, was one of my projects where we were thinking about uh, talking clothes, where clothes know more than what I know. Uh, it, it has a very bright future. It's a very amazing and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, to your first question, I would definitely say that my technology, as you know, that um, comes from a very dark side of human activities, which are caused by humans. So I definitely want to see that uh, in future, in the next five years, Projects like Intrepid or Cultural Lens should never be required by our society. And that's what uh, something I wish for. I'm not very sure uh, how much effort it would require, but I know that a lot of people who are working towards it and we together can make it happen. So I'm very hopeful that in the next five years, my technology would not be required. We would be working on something completely different, you know, like what are the emotions of cars in, I in IoT or like, you know, autonomous cars and how we can understand their gestures and help people communicate with them. So that's something which I look forward to. Yeah. I have to say the thing that occurred to me, the first thing that popped in my mind was when you said the emotions of cars, um, I had to think of like, oh, now my car's emotions and now I'm going to fall really in love with my car. Not just the <laughs> color of my car, but actually there's the same color of the same car and they have different personalities. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I'm going a little off. I, no, I love actually, your ending. I did a project like this before. What's that? Yes. Yeah, you should check it out. It's called The City Car and it was done way back when I was like doing my undergrad and they could change the color of the car with different, depending on different people and who comes and uses it. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for how you ended it. Thank you for using uh, technology for our social good, uh, mm -hmm. not preventing social bad, but fostering social good. And um, I like that. And with mm -hmm. that, I want to say uh, thanks for the show. Um, mm -hmm. This was Coffee with Mr. IoT. 
um, today. And we'll be back next week again on Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific noon. Uh, noon pa sorry, I'm really 9 a.m. Pacific noon Eastern. And if you missed any part of the show, please check it out on my YouTube channel. And with that, have a great Friday. Bye. Bye.